Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 110 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us on the Knife Junkie Podcast, which is the place for knife newbies and knife junkies. To learn everything about knives and knife collecting and hear from knife designers, knife makers, manufacturers, reviewers, anyone who loves knives, you know you're in the right place with the Knife Junkie podcast. And Bob, uh, before we uh, introduce our guest today, I want to uh, mention the Knife Junkie's Instagram knife auction, which is actually going to be benefiting the organization of the person we're talking about today. That's right. When we did our April 18th town hall, uh, we got some donations from some guests. We have uh, an Emerson Super CQC7 to auction off. We got that from Stone and Steel, our good friend Stu over there. And then Bob Terzuola himself donated uh, to the the channel a um, a new copy of his book, a beautifully milled out titanium uh, logo bottle opener. And a knife, uh, the the drop uh, knife that he did, the first uh, collaboration drop knife he did with them, the compact tactical folder. Uh, so we have those two lots, and we're going to be auctioning them off on Instagram on Thursday. And uh, we will be, uh, it, it will start at 10 a.m., and it will go till 10 p.m. And at Thursday Night Knives, uh, as we start you know, I didn't schedule this well, Jim. I mean, I knew that this is how it was going to be, but it's going to be an interesting thing because we're just going to be starting the show Thursday Night Knives at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and the auction will be just ending. Right. So it's going to be a mad scramble, but it'll, it will be fun. And uh, both of those uh, lots will be uh, will be decided and won on that day. Starting bid for both lots is $100, and then for each bidding increment, it's $10. And for each new bid, you have to submit a new comment so that it's time stamped and so that we know what the what the very last bid is come 10 o'clock uh, when we start rolling on Thursday Night Knives. So, uh, yeah, it, it will be a great, uh, a great and wonderful thing. And then all of the money that we earn from that will be going to Knife Rights, the Ultimate Steel uh, annual fundraiser. That's right. So, uh, yeah, definitely get your bids in early and often uh, this coming Thursday, May 14th, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, as Bob said, all the benefits from his Instagram uh, knife auction, which everything was donated, and we certainly do appreciate that. But all the benefits do go to Knife Rights, which, uh, Bob, that's your guest today, Doug Ritter of Knife Rights, the ultimate steel, as well as uh, his own knife. So a lot of good stuff to talk about there with Doug today. Uh, yeah, that's right. We always like to have Doug on uh, just He's a very interesting guest and very experienced in the knife world, but also uh, we always like to get sort of the uh, the roundup of the recent legislative actions uh, that have uh, gone down with knife rights in, in various states. As, as we've talked a lot on this show, our state has been a battleground for knife rights uh, for, I don't know, about two years going now. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a hard, hard fought battle that hasn't been won yet, but... Uh, Maybe it's just about aging out administrations and starting fresh with new people. But it's great always to talk to Doug and, and to read the temperature. And right now, with uh, the way everything is shut down, uh, they need money more. They need funds more now than ever because, you know, when it's business as usual, knife rights are not uh, at the top of the mind of most legislators. Uh, and, and so right now, it's definitely not. So if we if we funnel some money in towards knife rights, keep them going – I think I think we'll find great things coming from him. All right. So a lot of a uh, lot of stuff there to hear about uh, from Doug Ry- uh, Doug Ritter and Knife Right. So without further ado, let's get into it here on the Knife Junkie podcast. Visit the Knife Junkie at theknifejunkie.com to catch all of our podcast episodes, videos, photos and more. So we're speaking with Doug Ritter of Knife Rights and of so many other things, but right now that's that's how I relate to him most. That and also his beautiful RSK Mark I uh, folding knife that's being made by Hogue right now. Doug, welcome, and thank you for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. Always a pleasure. Good to hear from you, sir. So tell me, how, how has the recent, uh, you know, the recent things going on in the world, the, the pandemic, how has it uh, 
affected you uh, and and your activities and knife rights uh, as it comes down? Well, it's really shut things down as it has for so many people. We left uh, SHOT Show uh, all excited with a very full calendar up through uh, through Blade Show. Uh, and within a few weeks, events started being canceled um, so that we got to basically nothing. <laughs> right. uh, the legislatures uh, quit legislating. The uh, shows quit showing. The uh, political meetings uh, have moved to uh, online uh, conferences uh, when they do occur. Um, it's it's made a mess of everything for us, just just like it has for so many people. Um, we are still hopeful that we will get some additional legislation passed uh, this year. Uh, Ohio and Michigan are still in play. Uh, they're having conversations about when they're going to get back to work at the legislature in those states. And we just have to, like everyone else, play it by ear. There's not much else we can do. Um, we're still planning on going to Blade, which is, you know, has been rescheduled to the uh, first weekend in August. Um, still planning on going to the Arkansas Knife Show in uh, September, as well as USN gathering. Um, and then we'll We'll see what happens. I mean, my crystal ball is no clearer than anyone else's crystal ball. I'm pleased, very pleased that we got West Virginia preemption bills done and signed by the governor before this all went totally south. Um, that goes actually goes into effect the end of this month. Um, what is a preemption bill? So preemption is when state law preempts local jurisdictions. So if you know the state law, there are no local laws that you have to worry about. Um, we have passed preemption now in 11 states, I believe, since we started uh, first here in Arizona. West Virginia is the 11th, I believe. West Virginia's preemption statute uh, basically added deadly weapons, including knives, to their state's firearms preemption statute. So come the end of this month, uh, if you know what the state law is in West Virginia about knives, which is pretty much they're all legal, then you know what the law is no matter where you go. Hmm. Uh, that's very important because what, what we don't want to have happen and the reason preemption is so important is because we don't want people to cross a city line or a county line and their legal knife suddenly becomes illegal. I mean, that's just a trap for unwary citizens who mm. can't keep track of that kind of stuff. Nobody can possibly keep track of all the local municipal laws and regulations, uh, particularly if they're traveling. Well, it seems like right now people who are uh, working, tradesmen, a lot of tradesmen are still at work, uh, people working outside, and uh, some on construction uh, who would be using knives might be traveling further afield to get to the job site these days and yeah, crossing county lines uh, and going through towns and municipalities in one state. Yeah, that could be that could be boggling. You could be a criminal on so many different counts just to get to and from work with a tool that you need. Uh, is is knife manufacturing, distributing and even like um, carrying considered essential uh, right now? Uh, how how's that viewed? Well, so carrying is is not relevant to the essential industries issues that we're dealing with with the pandemic. Uh, manufacturing, distribution, retail, and that sort of stuff uh, are certainly subject to sanctions. Uh, there are a few manufacturers who are dealing with uh, very difficult circumstances in their states because they're not considered essential. Uh, we're working to help some of them. Uh, there are other knife manufacturers who have managed to gain exemptions because they have government contracts and other means to convince the authorities that they are an essential business. I mean, let's face it. Uh, knives, just like firearms, are essential. Uh, the ability to manufacture, produce, and purchase those from folks is essential. Uh, first responders are certainly 
uh, users of these tools. And most of them purchase those through retail uh, outlets. So, you know, we think, we think they're essential. We're working hard in those instance, few instances where, um, state administrations for some one reason or another do not. And I think we're making some headway. You know, hopefully enough of these states will open up in the, in the next month or so that it becomes a, a moot point. But meanwhile, you know, some folks are hurting. Uh, I, I live in the great, uh, Commonwealth of Virginia. And as you know, our governor, uh, uh, turned down the, uh, the, the switchblade act or uh, the automatic knife act, or I can't remember exactly what it was called, but it would have allowed, uh, a company to open its doors near Roanoke, uh, not an extremely rich part of the state. And it would employ people and they would be able to, um, export the automatic knives they made there with American craftsmen. Uh, to other states where they're legal. And, uh, that, that was just, uh, just not good enough for our governor. And so he, he said no to that, which, uh, you know, did not help, uh, a, that area for sure, that part of his state. And now we're in a time where that tool or the, the, at least the manufacturing capability of creating tools like that could become, um, something that we all need. Uh, whether they're making, uh, knives or something else and to just put the kibosh on it all together because of some perceived optic. It's crazy. Um, yeah, we could probably, uh, go on at length about some of the irrational edicts that have, that have gone out. We have areas of Arizona that have been barely touched by this pandemic. Um, and they're being treated the same as areas of Arizona who have, uh, more considerable effect. Um, you know, you have areas in, in Virginia that are very populous that are having issues and areas that are very rural and there's no reason at all for those rural counties who have almost none of the, uh, COVID-19 cases, uh, to not be going. But, uh, knives still seem to be selling. People are sitting at home and ordering them and that's good for all of us in the, in the community. Um, and that's encouraging. It certainly has hurt certain aspects of the industry badly. And, you know, we, we, it certainly affects us with our ultimate steel fundraiser. You know, the timing worked out that we ended up doing our ultimate steel fundraiser at exactly the wrong time. And there was no real way to, uh, to avoid doing it at the wrong time. Those capabilities, the ability to make knives could, could be turned towards other valuable things in a time of crisis. And look, we happen to be in a time of crisis. Who knows what that company could be making right now, say, if they weren't making knives, which which also are essential gear. How do we get around that? I don't know that you can when you have a governor such as you have. And as you know, there exist in a few other states, particularly up in the northeast and, and east and seaboard. Uh, unfortunately, these folks have an irrational fear of, of knives and look at them as weapons rather than tools. Uh, as you point out, they spent too much time watching things like West Side Story and, and, and that sort of stuff. But that's politics. I mean, that's what we deal with all the time. And we're lucky in that, generally speaking, regardless of the party in power, we're able to get things done. I mean, 32 bills enacted in 22 states since 2010. Is proof of that. Say that again. Doug. Thirty-two bills enacted since 2010 in 22 states. Wow! And you don't you don't accomplish that uh, without bipartisan support, and you don't accomplish that without oftentimes having to go back again and again. I mean, there there are a number of states where we've had to make multiple trips to the state house in order to get something passed and. And pass a, a governor's veto. Uh, New York is an example. I mean, it took uh, five tries through the legislature, two vetoes by the governor, a case headed to the Supreme Court before we finally got him to sign our the gravity knife bill. So um, part of our success is just being stubborn and persistent. And we keep coming back and we keep coming back. Sometimes it's a matter of just waiting for the current resident of the governor's mansion to uh, to take a hike. 
go away and get replaced by somebody that sometimes we can have a rational conversation with. Because the objections that we find have no basis in rationality. They are emotional objections based on things like West Side Story and, and other uh, movies and, and shows that demonize uh, certain kinds of knives. And when we can get past that and have a rational conversation about uh, these being tools and they not being any more dangerous than any other uh, folding knife or, or fixed blade knife for that matter, then we can get somewhere. And, and we have in many cases with uh, uh, many different administrations of both parties. You mentioned gravity knife, Bill. Um, gravity knife, I know it's like an old paratrooper knife and it, it used gravity and you released uh, by pushing a sort of a lever down and it would release the blade if it was pointed down. How does that have anything to do with modern day legislation? Um, it has something to do with modern day legislation because the city of New York uh, decided that any knife that could be wrist flicked open, which is pretty much any folding knife, and that locks open, uh, would be deemed a illegal gravity knife. The penalty for which is a potential year in jail. Um, and if you have a prior, it becomes a felony. And liter people were literally sent to prison for carrying a uh, common folding knife that, you know, we all carry every day. Um, and that was a nine year battle against the city of New York, um, including a case that uh, went up to the Second Circuit twice and was on conference with the Supreme Court when uh, Governor Cuomo decided to sign our bill rather than take the chance that he would lose at the Supreme Court. Well, I'm, I'm going to hit this uh, again before uh, we end the show, but I, I think this is probably a, a good time to ask this. What is your advice for anyone who has a run-in with law enforcement for whatever reason, and they have a knife on them. What, what's your first uh, line of advice? Well, we actually have an app for that. <laughs> an app for that? That's we awesome. An, we have an app. For, our Legal Blade app, which includes the knife laws of uh, all 50 states and the District of Columbia and about 45 cities, <laughs> includes a section in, in the... Uh, Legal Blade app, uh, and it's on our website as, as well. That was written by, uh, Evan Knappen, uh, one of the foremost attorneys regarding your knife rights and knife law. And it's, uh, it's called If Stopped or Arrested. And it walks you through what you should and should not do if you're arrested. Uh, and he has a very, uh, simple mnemonic to remember the things. It's SAC, S-A-C. S stands for remain silent, uh, to say I assert my right to remain silent. Uh, A stands for ask for an attorney. I want my attorney or I want an attorney. And C, do not consent to any search. Do not make or give any sign or statements without your attorney's approval. Now, you need to be respectful, polite, and cooperative. Uh, you should never physically resist under any circumstances. But if you remain silent, if you ask for your attorney, and if you do not consent to a search, then you're going to find yourself in a much better place and your attorney is going to be thrilled that you haven't screwed things up for him by making it much harder to defend you. There's, uh, there's a great link on uh, that article on our website and on in the uh, app uh, to a wonderful video by a law professor who discusses all the ins and outs and why it's so important to remain silent. Uh, if you're being potentially subject to arrest. So I've, I've uh, you know, done the requisite fantasizing about that situation. You know, it's dark fantasy, but, you know, what would happen if I, you know, and I run, run, run through it and I'm like, oh, you know, I've worked with a lot of cops. They're, they're cool guys and they have an appreciation for gear. And maybe if I just appeal to their, and then I always stop and remember the other uh, times you and I have spoken. And if, if you're at the point of, a, of an interaction with a police officer where they're finding a knife and it's an issue, then you're probably too far to appeal to their cool side and their love of beer to get out of it. Is that just a silly way to look at it? No, it's a reasonable way to look at it. Look, if, if you find yourself in a situation with law enforcement and, they're, and it concerns your knife, you need to play cool. You need to 
not say anything that can be used against you. There's nothing that you can say that's going to change their mind. That's just the reality. Ask any defense attorney and he will tell you story upon story. He will bore you to death with stories of the stupid things that people said that were completely rational and completely reasonable and just dug a deeper hole for them. Now, if you ask a law enforcement officer what he tells his kids to do if they're potentially going to be arrested, they tell their kids, don't talk to the cop. <laughs> Call an attorney. Call me. Do not talk to the cop because they know they're in the business of getting people to talk to them and then getting in deeper. Yeah. So knife rights. We didn't define it right up front. If if someone is listening uh, this far, they can tell. They know what knife rights is. It's an organization that that is going state by state and changing uh, antiquated legislation that restricts uh, people from owning and carrying knives. And uh, like you mentioned before, you've you've done a hell of a lot. You said 32 bills in 22 states, I think. That's correct. So this is not a cheap or easy or quick fix. And uh, this obviously takes uh, resources and it, and, and it takes support, not just monetary, but monetary is, is the, real, the real deal, but it also takes uh, people behind you and uh, that's what the ultimate steal is all about. It's your fundraiser. Explain, you know, describe to me uh, what what the ultimate steal is, and tell everyone the kind of the kind of things that uh, they can look forward to getting involved with it. So the, the ultimate steal is our annual fundraiser. It's a it's a huge drawing, or actually, it's multiple drawings. Uh, we have uh, so far this year one hundred and thirty five thousand dollars worth wow. of knives, uh, firearms, an African safari. Tools, equipment, gear, knives valued up to $6,500, firearm packages valued up to $4,500. And you make a donation. Uh, you get in the drawing, depending upon how big a donation you make. Uh, you get potentially multiple chances to win. At certain levels of donations, we give you free knives. This year, we've got some great knives from uh, SOG from Spider Co., from We Knife, Cold Steel, and uh, Hogue uh, at the various uh, donation levels. Uh, so you not only get multiple chances to win, you get a free knife. And one of the unique aspects of the, of the Ultimate Steel is its winner's choice. Hmm. So the first person who is drawn gets their pick of everything in the drawing. And the circum second person drawn gets their pick of everything but what the first person did. Whoa, so that, got, that's so, cool. So so there's not just the grand prize. There, There's a prize that you can choose. And, you know, if you're into uh, tactical knives, we have that. If you're into buoys, if you're into firearms, you know, we've got something for everybody. Um, but you get to choose it. It's uh, unique in that aspect. It, it's a, extra work for us, but we think <laughs> it makes for a more more engaging fundraiser and and hopefully that encourages people to give. I mean, if you go to ultimatesteel.org, you're going to see an incredible selection of prizes that you can win. And and as a supporter, you can also can can you not pledge a knife at one of those levels and kind of donate it? Okay, I'm going to donate one of these SOGs that someone else can can win from the drawing. Is that right or am I getting that wrong? No, though we have had uh, individuals who received some of the donation bonus knives, uh, offer them up on Instagram or mm -hmm. Facebook mm -hmm. as an incentive for people to, you know, follow us and like us and, and check out the Ultimate Steel. A good part of our battle is getting people to the Ultimate Steel page. Once they're there and see what the prizes are and, and all the rest of the cool stuff, then it's much easier for them to understand. Wow, I could I could win this stuff. Yeah, uh, and and you know that that the funds that you donate are going to an organization that's getting it done for knife owners in America. I mean, when we started out, I think most people were skeptical. Now we have a track record that is the envy of most advocacy organizations, and, and we get things done that many people thought was impossible. Uh, and another thing I want to note, uh, 
hopefully it's the same this year. Last year, I noticed I'm a, I'm a procrastinator, uh, I will admit. And last year, I waited till just about the last minute to donate, even though I told you on the podcast, I'm going to donate as soon as we hang up. Well, it took me a while, uh, but uh, the, the Catholic guilt always sets in. And uh, I after I did it, I was like, that A, that was so easy and stupid that I didn't do this for the last like 10 years uh, or however long I had known about you until then. But also, if you do it early in the ultimate steel drive, your chances of winning a knife, or of just getting a knife for donating are astronomically high. Well, so we obviously have a fixed number of donation bonus knives, and when they're gone, they're gone. So so there's that. Um, we also have a early bird drawing to encourage people to give early in the drawing. Uh, that, that deadline is May 10th or May 15th. So if you donate before May 15th, you're actually in two separate drawings. And even if you win an early bird, your entries are put back into the main drawing. And the early bird is filled with all kinds of uh, production knives and firearms and other cool stuff. I mean, it's, it's just there's just so much neat stuff you can win. Uh, we have custom knives. We have limited edition knives. We have, you know, pistols, revolvers, long range rifles, optics on everything that shoots. All of the goodies that that people who are listening, who, who have listened this far, would love to win. No doubt. Exactly. Um, so, but I, I'd i be remiss if I didn't mention that before I knew of knife rights, I knew your name because of the Ritter Griptilian, the very extremely famous uh, knife that I think you're like the last or only, one of the few people to ever have Benchmade uh, as their OEM. I know a couple did, Ernest Emerson did it early on and, and such, but you made a legendary, designed a legendary folding kind of survival knife, if you will. Uh, that balanced, um, broad, slicey, uh, yet stout, fully flat ground, uh, blade on the, on the, on the griptilian sort of platform. And, um, years later, now it's being made by Hogue, uh, after it's gone through a number of upgrades and changes. And, uh, um, since last we spoke, I got one and, uh, I'm going to gush for just a quick second and say that it, 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 it has become one of two of my go-to like rough housing in the backyard folding knives, I have to say. And I love it. And there is seems to be very few things that can't cut through. It's uh <laughs> it's got it's got great geometry. And uh I've cut through things that I didn't intend to, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. Uh and this and and a 20 C V steel never needs to be sharpened or 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 the way I use it in my suburban dad sort of uses. Uh, and the way it feels in hand is amazing. This, this knife is incredible. I've told you what I love about it, but what, what do you think people love about this knife and why have people been following you from manufacturer to manufacturer over the years, uh, after this design? Well, I, I think it all goes back to the original design parameters, which was, uh, as, as a survival authority, I was often asked, you know, what knife would, what folding knife would you recommend? And there would always be a but at the end of that sentence. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, eventually, uh, working with Benchmade, we designed, uh, a knife, uh, take off from the, uh, Griptilian that Mel Pardue designed with a blade design of my own that was influenced by a number of folks, including, uh, Chris Reeves, Sabenza. And the, the concept, which everyone told me I was nuts when I did this back in 2004, uh, we were going to put a premium steel, uh, at that time, the most premium steel was S30V. Uh, we were going to put a premium steel blade in a plastic handle. And everyone said you couldn't sell it. And eventually, Benchmade said, well, if you'll buy them from us, we'll make them for you. And of course, today, as you know, everybody builds knives that way. Uh, right. so we, you know, so it's, it started the trend. Um, but it's a it's a, a a very useful blade shape. It's a wide core uh, drop point blade with a very high grind. Uh, so it's a, it's a slicer. Uh, I believe knives are designed for slicing, uh, not not other work. And and people like it. And and part of the goal was that it needed to be an extraordinarily good value. And it has always been a good value to get a premium steel blade and a knife that you could afford and didn't feel bad about using. 
now uh, we're producing it with Hogue. It has a G10 handle. It has CPM 20 CV steel. It's an incredible bargain at $159.95. A tremendous amount of milling went into this handle. I mean, it's radius to end. It's got this beautiful starburst uh, knurling. It's it's a beautiful handle to look at, and it just feels so great, too. I'm very pleased to hear that because that's how, what we set out to do. You know, it's not, it's not easy to come up with a handle that works. This is based in part on the concept of the Gertillion handle with a number of refinements that uh, I always wanted to do and was never able to do with Benchmade. Um, and the end result has been, I, I think, one of the best ergonomically designed handles out there. What are the refinements or the changes? You know, uh, like any creator, uh, something's out long enough and you have a chance to live with it. You're going to, you're going to want to make some changes in its next iteration. What were the, what were the main changes in going from the, uh, the last, uh, bench made, uh, Ritter uh, to this one, to the Hogue? So, so, I mean, obviously we went from a plastic reinforced nylon handle to a, uh, to a G10 handle, which is all, as you note, machined very beautifully. It has, uh, it's, the handle is slightly longer so that the lanyard hole is at the end of the knife where I wanted it. Uh, there's an, a, an index indentation, if you will, uh, to make it a little grippier without tearing you up the way the Griptilian can do at times. Uh, it's got a deep carry clip on it, which I like. It's got an open back and so the closed back of the original. The Able Lock, uh, which is our refined version of the uh, original Axis Lock, the Axis Lock patent was up in 2016. Um, the Able Lock, uh, ambidextrous bar lock enhanced, uh, I think most people will find it works much smoother uh, in this iteration from Hogue. Um, it's got Wolf's. U.S. made springs, which are renowned for their reliability. It's just, you know, little tweaks here and there have re resulted in a, you know, it, it, it's just a little bit better in all respects. We kept the identical blade shape, which everyone loved, heavy stone wash, which everyone loved. Um, and everything else has just been tweaked a little. So you keep saying little, little, little. And uh, it, it brings me to my next uh, topic. Is there something you'd like to say about the <laughs> about this knife? Well, um, you know, we're, we, we, we are recording this uh, a couple of days before the introduction of the, uh, the mini uh, RSK Mark II, Mark I G2. I think the second or third email I got when we introduced this a couple of years ago was, uh, so when are you going to produce a mini? <laughs> um, you know, the mini version of the, of the RSK Mark one was always very popular. Uh, smaller knives have become even more popular today. Yeah. Um, and we're, we're, we finally introducing it. Uh, I'm really pleased with the way it's turned out. It's not just a question of, uh, getting in the CAD program and shrinking everything <laughs> a certain amount, you know, going from a 3.44 inch blade to a 2.9 inch blade um, turns out to be a lot more complicated in order to get the same sort of ergonomics as you want. You know, your, your fingers don't shrink. Right. So your fingers still have to work. Um, your hand still has to grip with a smaller, smaller handle. But uh, you know, we, we, Hogue and I worked together, uh, persevered, if you will, and I'm just thrilled with the new Mini RSK Mark One G2. Everyone who's handled it, prototypes and stuff, is just like really excited. So you touched on this when when you're making a Mini version of something or a smaller version of something, you don't just reduce it by a percentage and call it a day. Uh, you have to account for the fact that. Like you said, your hand is still the same size. So how do you how do you solve that problem with, without having an unsightly blade to handle ratio problem? You just keep going back to the drawing board until you have something that works. I'm sure an engineer could maybe give you some you know engineering type talk, but yeah. for us, it was just a question. Okay, you start out by shrinking everything down, 
And then you start moving things around until things feel right. Yeah. Um, and not just not just in my hand, but in the hands of my wife and the hands of friends of mine who have, you know, huge hands. And I think I think we've arrived at a perfect compromise because every knife is a compromise. You know, when I give talks about survival equipment, I talk about people getting a knife. You know, I can show them my knife and I can say, you know, I think 95 percent of the people who grasp this knife are going to find it very comfortable to hold. There's always going to be 5% of the people who hate it, you know, because that's just yeah. the way people are. So it's always a compromise. And, uh, I think we, I think we've done a really stellar job of getting the ergonomics right on the mini, uh, just as we did on the full size. The people who've played with it, who have owned minis before, uh, in the first generation, uh, are like, yeah, let me know when I can buy one. Hmm. So, uh, and, and that, that to a designer is the ultimate sort of compliment. You know, when, yeah. you, when your, te when your testers want to buy what you're designing, you know, you're on the right track. Uh, yeah, I'd rather have this than 150 bucks or whatever it's going to cost. So is this going to also be a KnifeWorks exclusive? I know the first one, uh, the, uh, the full size is a KnifeWorks ex exclusive. Is this also? Yes, it is. Um, one hundred thirty nine ninety five from knifeworks dot com. Um, they are my partner in this in in this endeavor. It'll be a, it's available in uh, orange and black handles with a stonewash blade to start. As as you may know, we've expanded the original full yes. size uh, to include uh, now orange and black handles with stonewash blades, black handle with a black Cerakote blade, and we just last week introduced a flat dark earth handle with yes. a uh, black Cerakote blade, which is flying off the shelves. Yeah, I was going to say thank you for introducing that. Now it's another one I have to buy. I really appreciate that. Maybe you'll come out with an OD green one, too, and I'll have to get that as well. But I, I really think the black blade with the flat dark earth on this design, it just looks awesome. I love it. Uh, and apparently that feeling is, uh, is, is not uncommon because, uh, people have been buying it, which is, uh, gratifying because well, let's face it. Um, you know, as I explained to people, I can't do knife rights unless I have some income and these knives provide the income so that I can do knife rights because we've never, Sue and I have never taken a penny out of knife rights. So now, right now, uh, in, in, uh, the particular, time we're in does your survival are you using your um survival background and your survival skills teaching in any way right now how, how does that come into play during a, a stay in place pandemic well we're, we're, it's just having an interesting conversation today with with a, a friend about this very subject people often laughed at the fact that all of my survival kits that I've assembled for both commercial and uh, private use and for the military have included uh, quantities of toilet paper. And a lot of people thought that was pretty funny. I think the, the last couple months have shown uh, just how important toilet paper is. And I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to report that uh, at, at no time have we found ourselves short of either toilet paper or ammunition. Uh, <laughs> We're, we're in good shape there. Good. But, but the fact of the matter is, and, and this gets to where we are today is, you know, the vast majority of Americans would be horrified to travel into the third world and see how people deal with, uh, toilets and, and cleaning themselves afterwards and that sort of stuff. We are, we are spoiled rotten and we take it for granted. And I'm willing to bet that, that you will be hard pressed to find a household in America who now isn't going to keep about a month or two supply of toilet paper on hand. You know, I've, I've been thinking that not, not only in terms of the, the toilet paper, uh, thing, um, but also just in terms of just having a little bit of extra food around, uh, having, uh, other, other things that you've discovered you need or you need to have around. Uh, maybe you've discovered it during this time because you needed to run out to Home Depot and it wasn't possible or something like that. You know, it's gonna, it's gonna show people that it just doesn't mean you're some cockamamie weirdo if you, if you prepare. It, it means you're just, you're like kind of an old school person. Everyone throughout history is prepared until what, the last 15 years? <laughs> you know, like. Oh, it might, it might be a little longer than that, but the, 
when, when, when you have a disaster, whether it's a, uh, a natural disaster, hurricanes, earthquakes, that sort of thing, or it's a situation like we have now with, with this COVID-19 pandemic, more and more people eyes are open to the fact that, you know, you really have to be self-reliant to a significant degree when things go south and they can go south and you have no control over that, but you do have control over your own circumstances. Uh, you can put away, uh, what you need for a rainy day, so to speak. And that doesn't just mean, uh, savings in the bank account. That means having food, having, uh, tools, having the kind of stuff that you need, uh, should you find yourself in a situation where you can't just run down to the store to get stuff. Uh, and that's open, you know, this has opened eyes, uh, in places that I would never have expected. Yeah. You got to make a plan and have a kit. You got to stay informed. That's the, uh, that's, that's the mantra, right? You know, um, and then once you have some of those things in place, you can go about your life. Every once in a while, you get another can, another couple of cans, put them downstairs in the basement and forget about it. And then, uh, then, then, then you don't have to sweat it and, and freak out and run around in panic when things like this. It's been pretty calm around here, except for the homeschooling. You know, it's been pretty calm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never thought I'd have to look at algebra again. It's like, what are letters doing in math? I don't get that. I thought that was English. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased that we are, uh, beyond that stage <laughs> of our life, um, that, that we have to worry about that. And I have, uh, absolute sympathy for all my fr- friends who have been introduced to, uh, homeschooling rather, rather abruptly. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then I talked to our friends who've been homeschooling for years and they're like, yeah, so what's the big deal? Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was like, uh, I knew it all along. I knew we should have been homeschooling and, and here, <laughs> now we're doing it. Like it or not, it's not maddening at all. Uh, I'm just going to say that. So, uh, as we wrap up, uh, there are a couple of other things I want to hit, uh, real briefly. Uh, you just mentioned how people can, can get, uh, the RSK, uh, Mark one G2. That's generation two and, and it's smaller brother, which will be coming out shortly. Uh, they can go by to, the time, ta- by the time they hear this, it will be out. Oh, awesome. Uh, uh knife works and, and probably sold out. Sorry guys. <laughs> uh, it's a knife works exclusive. So go to knifeworks.com. And then I want to, I want you to reiterate, uh, just a bullet point, bullet point advice for, uh, uh an innocent knife guy like you and me who just happens to get uh, on the wrong side of the law with a knife, what should they do? It's really simple. Remember, SAC, S-A-C. S in SAC stands for remain silent. Do not talk to the cop. I assert my right to remain silent. A, ask for your attorney or an attorney. And C, do not consent to a search. Do not make or sign any statements without your attorney approval. Just remember, always be respectful, polite, and cooperative, and never physically resist under any circumstances. Yeah. And in in, uh, two words, like you said before, be cool. Now, how do people support knife rights? How do they donate to Ultimate Steel or, or, uh, you know, get, get into the Ultimate Steel? And then I want you to tell us about the Legal Blades app. Okay. So, uh, you can donate at the Ultimate Steel by either going to ultimatesteel.org or you can go to knifrights.org and click on the Ultimate Steel logo at the top of the page. The Legal Blade app is available in the App Store and Play Store for both Android and iPad. It is, uh, got all the laws of all the states and many of the major cities. And if you know the law, you can prevent yourself from breaking the law. Amen. Uh, ignorance is, is no excuse, uh, uh, this day and age. That's for sure. Uh, Doug Ritter, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast and updating us on, uh, everything that's going on with knife rights. And of course, uh, your awesome knives, the RSKs, uh, being made by Hogue. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. Always happy to do so. Have a question or maybe you just have a comment? Give us a call at 724-466-4487. We'll answer your question on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. That number again, 724-466-4487. 
All right, back on the Knife Junkie podcast, episode number 110, Doug Ritter there of Knife Rights, Ultimate Steel, and of course, his own knives. Uh, a lot of stuff uh, that you conversed about, Bob. What, uh, what, I, it's hard to ask for one key takeaway or one main point that you came out of it with, but your thoughts. Well, there isn't one, but there are two. There are two things. Every time I talk to Doug Ritter, it's like I walk away wanting to get something. And he's not a salesy guy at all, but I most definitely want to get uh, the new uh, mini uh, uh, version of his knife from Hogue. Uh, it, it would be the RSK Mark II, I believe, uh, the the small 2.9-inch bladed uh, version of this. Um, if not as a companion piece, just to have as a, uh, as a back pocket knife, because uh, the big version of this knife is so excellent, and, and I already have a, a mini Griptilian from, from Benchmade that I... I don't know. It would just it would just really fit the collection well. And now I'm just stammering uh, for justifications. But I want that knife, uh, the the new mini Ritter. And then the other thing is the Legal Blade app, which to me is a, such a great idea because every state and then the uh, and then every municipality has its own knife regulations, and it gets very bogged down. And oftentimes, like in our state. The uh, the regulations are not clear, and they're in kind of antiquated language. You start talking about dirks, people are people don't know what you're talking about unless you're some sort of a, you know, a real knife enthusiast. So uh, Legal Blade app is a great idea. It's just something you can have on your phone that will tell you what the deal is in all fifty states and kind of break it down in uh, in modern parlance. Well, and as Doug said, the uh, Legal Blade app is available for both uh, iPhone and Android in the uh, the uh, respective app stores there. So uh, download that and uh, carry that right with you on your smartphone. That way you'll be uh, always in the know while you're on the go. And uh, again, KnifeRights.org is the place where you can find out everything about Knife Rights, the organization, as well as right front and center right now on that page is all the details about Ultimate Steel. And man, oh man, are, are there a lot of things that you have the the potential to win if you'll just uh, donate. And it's a sliding scale, more entries for the more you give. And I thought it was pretty cool, the uh, the raffle if, you were, raffle, if you will, or the drawing, if you will, you get your choice. It's not like if your name is chosen, you get this. Your name is chosen, number one, you get the choice of anything. And number two gets the choice of anything except for what number one picked. I thought that was a really yeah. cool idea. Yeah, and, and and it's a real testament to to knife rights and to Doug Ritter himself uh, that all of these makers and manufacturers donate so much uh, product towards the ultimate steel that uh, that people who donate can win. And um, you know, I, I, every time I talk to Doug, it it's uh, underscored how lucky we are to have him. He's not a big bombastic guy out out in front uh, attracting attention all the time, but. He's behind the scenes all the time fighting for us, and uh, he's just a cool dude. All right. Again, KnifeRights.org. KnifeRights.org. You can find out about the organization and the ultimate steel. And again, remind you about the Knife Junkies Instagram auction this Thursday, May 14th, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. That's on the Knife Junkies Instagram account that you can find at thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram. So for Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person, saying thanks so much for joining us on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.